So we're going to move gradually. You heard that Aspergillus is really an opportunistic pathogen for humans. We're going to move gradually from the bench through the host pathogen interactions and finally ending up on the clinic. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Rob to share his thoughts. Rob is from Dartmouth Medical School, if I can read your writing correct, yes? He's a clever lad, much cleverer than I am, and you, as you can see, he's even better looking, so, Rob. Awesome. Well, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you today what we're doing in my laboratory at Dartmouth, um, trying to combat, uh, combat this so-called menacing mold. And so, the message I want to leave to you today is that Oxygen is really important for the host pathogen interaction, not just with aspergillus, but with other fungi and infectious disease. And kind of the punchline for my talk here is um, some of the ideas that we've been exploring in the laboratory and, um, and also in discussions with other colleagues is it's really trying to manipulate the infection microenvironment to improve treatment outcomes. And I'm going to present some data to support that hypothesis and, you know, hopefully um, get some great feedback from those of you that are on the front lines dealing with these patients and, and letting us know, you know, what is feasible, what is not feasible, where are we uh, uh, taking a wrong turn. And so we were joking last night at dinner that it's hard to have a good barroom argument now with Google and cell phones, right? But I think one argument you can have is what is the greatest scientific discovery that's ever been made? And I think you can make a great argument that it's oxygen. And I love the story of the discovery of oxygen because it also highlights a lot of issues that we still have in academia to this day. And it also highlights the fact that mice were being used very early in biomedical research and that they still remain a very valuable research tool for our community and for many communities. So oxygen was discovered by a Swedish pharmacist, Carl Wilhelm Scheele, in 1772. That's when he did his experiments. And you can see that it took quite a long time for that paper to get published. Two years of peer review. How would you feel about that <laughs> these days? Not so good. And so in the meantime, while his paper was being peer reviewed, a reverend, Joseph Priestley, uh, beat him to the punch and got his paper published first, even though his experiments actually were conducted two years later than, um, than Professor Shields. And so you can see the quote here from the paper uh, by, by Reverend uh, Priestley and the fact that he actually used mice. And so these mice that are incubated in his chamber, um, they were more active, they did better, they were just happier animals. And, um, and so he concluded that, you know, yeah, this, this is a pretty good um, uh, molecule. And actually, these were the first experiments that showed oxygen is an element. Okay, so really interesting. And so the evolution of oxygen is important. I think there's two points here on this slide that I want to make for, for, for us to think about and how we can harness oxygen as a therapeutic. The first is that oxygen uh, occurred during this great oxidation event thanks to the actions of cyanobacteria that developed a photosynthesis, and we had this rapid increase in oxygen. And this is, was a dramatic event in the history of, li of, of life on Earth. This was cataclysmic to most of the organisms that were present at that time. And so what does that mean clinically? That means that oxygen is powerful. It can control the metabolism of life on this planet. And in fact, it's been argued very convincingly with great data that this event is what drove the development of multicellularity. So if that's the case, we should really be looking at the mechanisms through which organisms deal with oxygen as potential Achilles heel. The second point I want to make on this slide is that fungi and animals diverged about 1.5 billion years ago. And they diverged at about at a time when oxygen levels were around 10% in the atmosphere. Okay, and so this divergence in time from a temporal perspective gives us a lot of opportunity to find Achilles heels in the genomes of these organisms for how they deal with oxygen and altered redox environments. And so this slide here, I think it's an old slide from a long time ago, but it illustrates the point that we're trying to think about in the laboratory is that the basically the habitats that an organism can grow in are restricted 
by redox potential and pH. Okay, and so redox potential is primarily driven by the amount of oxygen that's in a given environment. And so what you're seeing in this graph here is the restriction of certain types of bacteria and in where they can grow in the environment depending upon the redox and the pH. So think of this as a patient, right? So some organisms we find in the lung, some we find in the brain, some we find in certain patients that get certain types of chemotherapeutic agents, some get antibodies that are immune suppressive, okay? And we see different organisms and different strains within an organism in these different habitats, okay? And so there's some metabolic complementarity that is going on here, okay, that's allowing these organisms to thrive in these immune compromised patients. And it's interesting, if you look at the history of microbial virulence, a lot of early studies looked at this ability to thrive in these low redox environments. And so there was a strong correlation between the ability of a microbe to proliferate in these low redox, low oxygen environments and virulence before we had the power of molecular genetics. And so the idea is kind of summarized here. So in a healthy patient which doesn't get aspergillus, doesn't get fusarium, doesn't get sketosporium, our tissue is slightly oxidizing and our immune system is fully functional. Okay? Our immune system needs this environment to be able to provide the antimicrobial response to control these infections. However, when you get an invasive infection with the fungi and with other organisms, what happens to the tissue is that your redox environment drops dramatically. Okay? And this is primarily due to a reduction in oxygen levels at the site of infection. And so our medical interventions do this. They do this naturally, whether it's cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin, it's an ana the newest antibody that's immune suppressive. And then also you can have genetic mutations in the host that alter the host's ability to modulate redox homeostasis on a tissue specific level. Okay, and these provide windows of opportunity for certain microbes to come in and cause disease. And so the model that we've been working on in the laboratory is kind of depicted here. It's a little bit complicated, but the point I want to make is that disease occurs in infectious disease in particular when you have redox imbalance. And this occurs when you have a microbe that's capable of thriving in these low redox environments. And when that microbe thrives and proliferates, it increases the amount of host damage that it's caused. And that host damage, as Arturo elegantly talked about, can also come from also the dysregulation of the host response when redox homeostasis is perturbed. So really, we want to get back over here, right? We want to find balance in the system where the microbe and the host are living in harmony together. And this occurs when redox homeostasis Okay, between the bug and the host are complementarity with each other. Okay, and so the idea here is then that microbial bioenergetics, and I use the term bioenergetics as a broad term for the metabolic power of an organism to proliferate in a given environment. Okay, really is a virulence rheostat, and this encompasses the idea that the host is playing a huge role here in determining which microbes can cause infection. But the microbe is having a huge role here too. Okay, so you have to have this complementarity to get proliferation and to get damage. So how have we gone about trying to explore these hypotheses and then more importantly take advantage of them clinically? So this is one of the first experiments um, that really got me excited about oxygen. And um, it's a very simple experiment. This is the invasive aspergillosis animal model that um, I learned so beautifully from Bill Steinbach at, at Duke when I was a postdoc. At Duke, and it's a great model because the, the, the mice inhale the spores naturally, and you're able to then establish an invasive infection in the context of an immune suppression uh, regimen. And there's different immune suppression regimens that are used in the community. In this particular experiment, we used cyclophosphamide to uh, make the mice leukopenic. So, we, what we did then is during the course of the infection, we did bronchial alveolar lavages, and we took the lavage fluid out and we put it into the NMR and we looked at the metabolites that were being produced during the host pathogen interaction. So you can appreciate that in an animal that was mock inoculated with PBS, there's not a lot going on in lavage fluid, it's mostly saline. And um, however, during the infection in mice that are inoculated with aspergillus, there's some really interesting metabolites that all of a sudden appeared. Most specifically, metabolites associated with fermentation in low redox environments. And so, 
Ethanol was highly abundant in these bronchial alveolar ravages. Lactate, which most likely was coming from the host, is response to these low redox environments. Alanine is a microbial and a eukary, uh, a mammalian product of low oxygen metabolism. And then, of course, acetate is another big microbial product that's produced uh, during low oxygen conditions. And so what I'm telling you is that aspergillus is making beer in your lungs. <laughs> But uh, on a more serious note, what this told us was that the fungus had really changed its physiology, its metabolic bioenergetics to adapt to this new environment that it found itself in. And importantly, you all know in the audience that that aspergillus likes it. It does well in this environment and it proliferates, it causes host damage and causes disease. So where is the low redox environment coming from? You know, we don't have... Uh, a specific quantitative data yet to, uh, that's causative, but the general idea now that's more widely accepted than it was when I started my lab 10 years ago is that you can get these regions in the lung, the most oxygen-rich organ in the body. And so the case, the, the, probably the, the best example is the cystic fibrosis lung, which has been now shown to be extremely hypoxic with, uh, with all the mucus accumulation. But now also in animal models of tuberculosis, as well as we've shown, as I'll show you in a minute, in aspergillus, at the site of infection, due to damage caused by the invading fungus, as well as the inflammatory response of the host, you really get massive depletion of oxygen levels very rapidly in these, in these models. Okay? And this leads to the, the reduction in um, redox potential. And so here's just some data from our animal model showing the development of hypoxia. And so in red here, is a, um, an oncological probe uh, called pimidiozole hydrochloride used to monitor hypoxia in solid tumors. And so we use it in our animal model to really see where these low oxygen environments are occurring. And I want to make two points on this slide. One, there's a misconception um, amongst a lot of people, unfortunately, that hypoxia is an absolute level of oxygen. That's not the case. So hypoxia is when oxygen demand Okay, is not met by the oxygen supply for a eukaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell for that matter. And that can occur at any level of oxygen, depending on the physiological needs of the organism. And so what we're depicting here on this slide is the pimidazole chloride is only able to detect severe hypoxia. This is oxygen levels below 1.5% atmospheric levels. This is a massive amount of hypoxia. And in green here is the aspergillus. So you can see right at the site of infection, as the fungus evade, it goes out of the airway and evades into the lung parenchyma, it's surrounded by this hypoxic region. Okay? So this really has a huge impact on both the pathogen's physiology as well as the host. So we've started to look at this a little bit closer by looking at what's the impact of, of uh, drugs that are used to treat these patients and that also these patients may be on to treat underlying disease. And so this is brand new data that we just got recently where we've done a metabolomics profile of steroid-treated animals and, um, for, uh, to model graft versus host disease. And so the column I want you to look at right here is in this group right here, what we did is we just took healthy mouse lungs and compared them to steroid-treated mouse lungs and looked at the metabolite profile to try and get an idea of how the treatment is affecting the redox environment and the nutrient environment um, in response to this medical intervention. And these two groups here separate very nicely by PCA analysis. And so the steroid treatment is having a huge effect on the physiology of the host uh, in the context of, of, of the lung. And this is just some uh, data here showing you some of the metabolites that change. And I just want you to look at the yellow. The yellow is lipids. And so steroids produce a massive increase in the amount of lipids that are available in the lung. And how the fungus metabolizes lipids is becoming a really important area uh, of research in our laboratory because it really is looking like that, at least in this particular medical intervention treatment, this is what's perhaps uh, contributing to a, a growth of aspergillus in, in this particular environment. Um, and so the general idea, again, is that this hypoxic or low redox environment metabolism of the pathogen really is a potential Achilles heel for this organism. It's the environment that your patients have that you're trying to treat. You're treating an established infection that has these lesions in their lung. And so the, knowing what the physiology of the fungus is in these environments could be a huge advance for developing new therapeutics. And of course, aspergillus is the organism uh, 
we're most interested in. And so just to give you some more data about how huge an effect this low oxygen environment has on the fungus, um, we've done a lot of different approaches, including transcriptomics, proteomics, and the metabolomics approaches that I showed you recently. And I also want to make the point here that um, has come up a lot at this meeting is that not all Aspergillus fumigata strains are the same. And in fact, they respond quite differently to uh, low oxygen conditions. And so these are two commonly used strains in studies in laboratories across the world of microbial pathogenesis. So CA10 came from the Pasteur Institute. AF293 came from um, Manchester and David Denning's group. Look at this dramatic morphological change in the response to low oxygen conditions between these strains. And I'm going to come back to this because this does have an impact on the outcome of the infection in these animals that I'll, I'll address. But when you stress the fungus with a low oxygen environment, look at the amount of the genome that changes, or the transcriptome in response to this low oxygen. 30% of the genome changes within 30 minutes. Okay, and, and many of these pathways that respond to low oxygen conditions are the pathways you're trying to target as clinicians to treat this infection. So the pathway that's increased the most is the ergosterol biosynthesis pathway. So sterile biosynthesis requires 12 molecules of oxygen to produce one molecule of ergosterol. It's a highly oxygen-dependent process. The cell wall changes dramatically. We published a paper a few years ago showing a rapid remodeling of the cell wall in response to low oxygen conditions, which changes the polysaccharide composition and does impact the efficacy of caspofungin uh, against a hypoxic treated aspergillus uh, hyphae. So my laboratory is focused a lot on the transcriptional response, much like Tamara talked to you about with cryptococcus. It allows us to avoid per perhaps potential, the potential for genetic redundancy in a lot of these pathways to test the hypothesis that low oxygen adaptation might be important for, for fungal virulence. And so we focused on uh, this transcription factor right here, which Nate uh, didn't mention, but he had on his slide, um, SRBA. Uh, it's a sterile regulatory element binding protein that was um, in fungi first discovered by Peter Espen Shade's laboratory at Johns Hopkins in 2005, working in fission yeast. And the hypothesis based on our transcriptomics data and Peter's work was that SRBA was going to be a major regulator of the fungal response to hypoxia and the driver of allowing the organism to adapt to these low oxygen environments. And our molecular genetics approach illustrates that here very beautifully. So we make a genetic null mutant of Aspergillus fumigatus that cannot, uh, uh, that no longer has SRBA. And you can see that that null mutant grows perfectly fine at oxygen levels that we normally use in the laboratory. But uh, under low oxygen conditions, the mutant can't grow at all. And so it gave us a great tool to test the hypothesis that hypoxia fitness was important in these uh, host pathogen interactions. And we got this amazing result, and, and this uh, survival curve is from the leukopenic model of invasive aspergillosis, but this result holds up in the corticosteroid model uh, as well as a model of uh, chronic granulomatosis disease, a CGD model. And all three of these uh, clinically relevant models, the SRBA null mutant is fully attenuated in virulence. And um, it's an interesting, if you look at a little bit closer at the host pathogen interaction, uh, the first 24 hours of the infection, I remember when we did this experiment, all the mice looked sick. They, you know, they, they displayed signs of a respiratory, a respiratory infection. And, um, you know, it's like, oh, this, this isn't going to pan out. Um, and, and so, but what ended up happening is that the SRBA mutant um, was able to grow for the first 24 hours, but as that hypoxia set in from the inflammation and the tissue damage, it stops growing and its fungal burden um, is dramatically reduced and the mice are all able to survive the infection. So um, a, a, again, uh, on Nate's slide, he mentioned that SRBA was important in drug uh, susceptibility. And here you see very nicely that when you lose SRBA, which is a major regulator of sterile biosynthesis in the fungus, you now get a clinically relevant MIC to fluconazole all the way down below one microgram per mil. And then you also get an over tenfold increase in the MIC to voriconazole. And um, Mike Bromley and David Denning's group recently published a paper where they knocked out SRBA and some of these azole resistant strains. And perhaps not surprisingly, but very importantly, they showed that loss of SRBA genetic network in these azole resistant strain restore, uh, restores uh, susceptibility azoles, um, as we showed in wild type strains uh, back in 2008 and 2012. 
So, oh, so we're taking multiple approaches to understand how SRBA mediates these responses. We've done ChIP-seq, which allows us to go in vivo and actually see what genes are regulated by SRBA. We've done transcriptomics analyses to look at the response to the fungus and in, 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 to different environmental perturbations and the presence and absence of SRBA. And there's a really cool story here. The story is, is that SRBA is the master regulator of allowing this fungus to adapt to these low oxygen environments. So you look at these pathways that SRBA directly regulates, they all are associated with oxygen utilization or oxygen consumption. Okay, so it seems to be this master regulator to provide fungi with fitness in these low oxygen environments and therefore virulence. And so one of the target genes coming back to the ethanol story in, in, um, in the lung uh, turned out to be alcohol dehydrogenase. And actually it's a transcription factor regulated by SRBA, uh, another SREBP family member, SRBB, that's the direct regulator of ethanol fermentation in this fungus. And if you make a null mutant of the alcohol dehydrogenase, we got a dramatic reduction in fungal burden in those lesions in the lung. Um, and this data also turned out to correlate with an increase in this, at least the survivability or the recruitment of neutrophils to the site of infection. And so the general idea then, or the conclusion that we drew was that ethanol produced by aspergillus at the site of infection is immunosuppressive. And of course, there's clinical data in alcoholics, uh, where alcoholics, of course, have a huge increase in their susceptibility to acquiring pneumonia. And um, it's through um, inhibition of um, some of the innate defense path pathways um, that are important for controlling these infections. So in conclusion with SRBA, we, we, we're establishing this genetic network, what SRBA regulates, how it interacts with other pathways in the fungus to confer hypoxia fitness. And importantly, this really is important for virulence. And so there's some really interesting regulatory mechanisms for how this genetic network is induced that we're really interested in. And many of the genes in that network are fungal specific and perhaps could be harnessed in the future for therapeutic um, targets. We're particularly interested in this one, CREA, going back to the lipid uh, data that I showed you. And this particular gene is critical for controlling carbo, uh, carbon and nitrogen metabolism in the fungus. And we, uh, we're working on a, a, a study that's uh, exploring the role of CREA in allowing the fungus to adapt to that uh, lipid-rich environment in the lung. So I wanted, as I mentioned, I wanted to come back to this idea of heterogeneity. And so this is a plate that I had my student um, uh, put together. So we just took a bunch of strains of Aspergillus fumigatus that we've been sent graciously from uh, Sean Lockhart and Mihalis Leonakis and Tobias Hole, among others. And uh, we grew the plate in hypoxia. And if you just look at this plate, you might think there were four or five different fungal species on this plate. But these are, in fact, Aspergillus confirmed Aspergillus fumigatus isolates. And so we, we see this as an opportunity to better understand how this fungus adapts to these low oxygen environments, looking at the natural heterogeneity that exists within the population. And we wondered if this was going to be important clinically. And going back to those two strains that I showed you that had dramatic differences in hypoxia fitness, they often end strain is hypoxia fit. Um, for determining the outcome of the host pathogen interaction. And so we've, we've started a, a study with uh, um, acquiring these strains with clinical data from the environment. We uh, have set up an assay to test for hypoxia fitness, and then we use the mirroring model um, to look at virulence. And so when you correlate median survival with the hypoxia fitness uh, ratio metric that we've developed, we get a very strong correlation um, between hypoxia and the ability of Aspergillus fumigatus strains to cause disease in the context of steroid treatment. And, um, and so we're continuing to explore the mechanisms here, but you know, this, when we sent the paper in for review, we got a little bit of a pushback, I think. And I, you know, I understand why, you know, we're making the, arguably the first correlation with a phenotype here with um, heterogeneity within this, this particular important pathogen. And I think um, the point I wanna make here is that hypoxia has a huge impact, as you saw from the transcriptomics data, on this fungus that it touches many virulence pathways that people study. And so it changes carbon metabolism dramatically. It alters the cell wall. It completely remodels the cell wall. It alters iron homeostasis, which is a known uh, 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 important part of Aspergillus's virulence arsenal. It changes the stress response, okay? It alters the unfolded protein response. And it also really uh, impacts drug 
uh, efficacy by altering sterile biosynthesis. So perhaps it's not surprising that you would get a correlation with virulence um, in, in this particular environment. So how do we get a little bit more at causation? So we've, uh, we're taking multiple approaches, as, as I hope you can appreciate, and this is one I'm really excited about. And so we just made the hypothesis, if this correlation is true and perhaps potentially causative, we should be able to take uh, one of these low oxygen um, deficient strains and do an experimental evolution study um, in the presence of low oxygen. Uh, and it should, uh, you know, the hypothesis was is that this would confer virulence on, on the organism. And so that's what we've done. We took uh, the attenuated AF293 strain and we passaged it for 20 generations um, in low oxygen conditions. And we got a surprise at around generation 20. And that surprise is that we dramatically increased the hypoxia fitness of this strain. You can see the morphology has changed. That colony biofilm is much denser, much thicker. This fungus is way happier in hypoxia than its parent. Here's the biomass ratio. And there is a cost to this, to this particular strain. It now has decreased fitness in the presence of oxygen, which is interesting. And so we're trying to figure out what happened in this strain. And, and, and the reason we're trying to figure that out is here. We were able to get an almost 50% increase in the virulence of this strain simply by in vitro passaging it through low oxygen conditions. And so now we have a tool to look at what the mechanisms were, what mutations happened in this strain to help better understand how aspergillus adapts to low oxygen environments and also um, some of the mechanisms that it used to cause disease. So we have some hints of what happened in this strain. It's, it's using oxygen better and more efficiently. And so this is some data using uh, the new Seahorse Bioflux Analyzer that's available and, and a kind of a hot tool, especially in the immunology field, but we've adapted it for use with aspergillus. And so oxygen consumption rates um, here are dramatically different between these two strains with our evolved strain consuming much less oxygen than the, the parental strain and presumably providing then oxygen for other anabolic processes that drive proliferation like cell wall biosynthesis, for example. Um, and so another point I want to make here, you know, as we've done this, um, eukaryotic cells from, from mammals consume around 200 picomole um, of oxygen per minute. Look at what Aspergillus is doing. It's a two to three-fold increase. This fungus consumes a massive amount of oxygen in a very short period of time. Um, and so this optimization of the biogenics under low oxygen conditions, we hypothesize, is, is critical for virulence. So some of you may have uh, known where this was headed. And if we're talking about oxygen and we want to take advantage of this clinically, the, the, the logical experiment to do is to look at hyperbaric oxygen. And there, there's been literature written on this. Uh, Dimitrios is sitting in, in the second row here, and, and he's published some work on looking at HBO in the context of mucor infections. There's anecdotal case reports in the literature that hyperbaric oxygen has been used to treat invasive aspergillosis at certain centers. Um, the case reports generally are positive. But there's, there really hasn't been a rigorous trial done to see if there's any efficacy here at all. But the idea, again, here is that with hyperbaric oxygen, we can manipulate the infection microenvironment to change the fungal physiology, to get it out of this, this damage-promoting low-oxygen physiology that's so detrimental to the host. And, you know, that was the idea. There, there's some technical challenges, and, and one of the technical challenges is that the lesions caused by aspergillus are so incredibly dense. There's so much infarction and thrombosis that we really were wondering if we could even get oxygen to those regions to affect the, the fungus. And so in general, for those of you that don't know, the, the, the basis for HBO therapy is that your hemoglobin is already 97% saturated with oxygen. You really can't increase that uh, any higher. But what you can do, based on Boyle's gas law with hyperbaric oxygen, is increase the amount of oxygen in plasma, which then can diffuse through these uh, infarcted regions, um, providing oxygen to the fungus and also to the, uh, the patient. And so, you know, here, here's some data. And um, uh, I will be, uh, this is, I'm happy to talk about this data more. Um, the effect on the fungus is dramatic. So we wanted to, um, uh, you know, do this in as clinically relevant a way as possible. And so historically it had been already, you know, a lot of people had shown in the 40s and 50s that hyperbaric oxygen completely inhibit fung and fungal growth and bacterial growth as well. 
But those experiments were done not in a way that um, really was clinically relevant because they would start from spores or yeast cells or bacteria cells and immediately put them into hyperbaric conditions, which of course is not what your patient has. Your patient has a biofilm that's formed in the lung. And so the idea was, is, well, what does hyperbaric oxygen do to a biofilm? So the data I'm showing you here is we've went ahead and formed uh, uh, aspergillus biofilms on, on plates and then we began uh, sequential hyperbaric oxygen treatments. And, you know, under this regimen here, I hope you can appreciate that, you know, after five hyperbaric oxygen conditions compared to the, the biofilm that was not treated with hyperbaric oxygen, there's a dramatic reduction in fungal burden. You know, and I, I you know, I, I think this is exciting uh, that we can reduce fungal growth this much um, by simply treating the organism with hyperbaric oxygen. And you do need the hyperbaric. 100% uh, oxygen will not do this. Aspergillus loves 100% oxygen. It grows very well under those conditions. And so if you look at what's going on in the fungus uh, physiologically, uh, this hyperbaric oxygen is completely shutting down metabolism. So this XTT assay measures the ability of the fungus to reduce an agent, this, um, this tetrazoleum um, a compound, and it, it's completely shut off uh, in the presence of hyperbaric oxygen. And so we've done some RNA-seq experiments uh, that we're still analyzing the data to try and figure out how this effect is mediated. And, and the reason we're doing that is, you know, I'll, the animal experiments haven't gone that well, uh, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, you know, we, we do see a very modest effect. So in, in the animal model here, again, this is the leukopenic aspergillus model, we saw a 20% um, increase in survival with just hyperbaric oxygen. So on the one hand, I think that's something to potentially get excited about. Um, on the other hand, the fungal burden data wasn't particularly dramatic. We had less than a two-fold decrease um, at these late time points in fungal burden. There was a delay initially, so very early with the first two hyperbaric treatments, we seemed to be having a, a decent effect, but as the infection um, continued, uh, that effect was minimized. Um, and you'll notice right here, our mock HBO treated mice, we lost two animals, and those animals died from seizures. And we did also lose two animals in the fungal treated HBO group from seizures as well. And, you know, we, we, we are working with um, uh, the Hyperbaric Medicine Center to, to figure out what that, what that is. Um, and uh, it, it turns out that they, they might have had some um, left atrium uh, defects. And so this may not have been directly related um, to the, the hyperbaric oxygen. So, um, the, but the idea here is that we can take advantage of this mechanistically. And so, um, oxidative stress um, has been proposed to be the mechanism of action for um, hyperbaric oxygen. So you can see here that a mutant of Aspergillus fumigatus that doesn't have superoxide dismutase and can't deal with ROS is fully virulent. This is from Jean-Paul's lab. And so this was surprising to a lot of people. But if you look at this mutant, it actually has a growth defect in the presence of oxygen but it doesn't have a growth defect in the presence of hypoxia. And so our idea was is that, um, and you can also see that illustrated here, in hypoxia the sod mutant grows very well um, compared to normoxia. So the idea was is that the hyperbaric oxygen could work if you could also thwart the fungal's antioxidant defense systems. And our preliminary experiments here in the mouse model suggest that this is the case. And so the HBO therapy is stopped here and then we started to see fungal burden. So one, this means HBO is static in these conditions, but it does suggest that if you inhibit the antifungal, uh, the antioxidant effects of, of the fungus in vivo, you can affect a real treatment here just by manipulating the oxygen levels. And so my last slide just illustrates kind of the take home message here is that, again, by manipulating the host um, a redox environment, we can really affect the physiology of the fungus and maybe even the host to really improve these treatment outcomes. And so I hope whether it's oxygen, whether it's iron, whether it's some other aspect of the infection microenvironment, I think there's real therapeutic opportunity here to manipulate the infection microenvironment to alter microbial virulence and host defense responses. And so um, thank you again for the opportunity to tell you about what we're doing in the laboratory, and um, I guess we'll take questions later.